Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, excellencies and distinguished guests. We are happy to welcome you all to the IMRF side event on accelerating the GCM implementation at the regional and national levels, which be, is being co-organized by ECA, ESQA, ECLAC, and ESCAP, the regional commissions. Allow me to start with a few house rules. Please note that this event is being recorded and is being live streamed. The language of this event is English and there is no interpretation available given that this is a global event. Um, given the size of this meeting, all participants except the speakers are on mute and are not able to open their cameras. Please address your comments and questions to the speakers via chat. I now hand the floor to the moderator of this event, Ms. Rosa Malango and uh, the Director of Re Regional Commissions New York. Given that she has still not joined uh, due to an unfortunate delay, I hand over to you, Yara, for the comments on her behalf. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, and good morning. And again, uh, apologies, Ms. Rosa Malango will join in a moment. But in the interest of time, I'm very pleased to deliver her opening remarks on her behalf. Uh, it is a great pleasure for, for us to welcome you all to the International Migration Review Forum side event on accelerating the global compact on migration implementation at the regional and at the national level. Uh, it will be an honor indeed to moderate this side event and be joined by high level government representatives, esteemed colleagues from the regional commissions and key stakeholders. As you all know, at the heart of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is the principle of leaving no one behind during our journey towards prosperity that is respectful of both people and the planet. The 2030 Agenda also recognizes migration as a key driver for sustainable development and migrants as key agents of development and also vulnerable groups to be protected. According to IOM's World Migration Report 2022, there are some 281 million international migrants in the world, which represents 3.6% of the global population. This number was severely affected by COVID-19 responses around the world. The General Assembly Resolution on Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration mandated the regional commissions to organize regional consultative processes that provide a bridge between assessing implementation at the national and the global levels. The event today draws on the conclusions, recommendations, and voices from four of the five regional reviews organized last year. With these brief remarks, um, I look forward to your reflections on regional realities, gaps, challenges and opportunities in implementing the global compact on migration, which should inform thinking at the global level. Thank you for your attention and we look forward to the discussion. Excellencies, um, ladies and gentlemen, we move now to the panel and please allow me to uh, join me in welcoming Her, Her Excellency, Marta Lucia Ramirez, Vice President of Colombia, who has recorded a video message. So may I kindly ask the colleagues to start the video, please. Thank you. Honorable Mrs. Rosa Malango, Director of the United Nations Regional Commission's Office in New York. Honorable Mrs. Sara Luigi Ismael Ariola, Under Secretary of the Migrant Workers Affairs Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines and Chair of the Asia Pacific Regional Review of the Global Compact for Migration. Honorable Mrs. Armida Lasalcia Azabayana, Executive Secretary of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Honorable Mr. Mario Shimoni, Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Honorable Mrs. Hannah Morsi, Deputy Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa. Honorable Mr. Munir Tabe, Deputy Executive Secretary of the Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. Honorable Professor Joseph Teye, Director of the Center for Migration Studies of the University of Ghana. Honorable Dr. Hayman Zori, President of the Egyptian Society for Migration Studies. I am honored to participate in this side event aiming to reflect on the challenges, gaps, and opportunities in the implementation of the Global Compact for Safe, orderly and regular migration. For Colombia, as a champion country of the global combat, we approach its implementation with the deepest commitment, especially in the world we currently live in, 
driven by volatility, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. The efforts to fulfill the vision and principles of the Global Compact are more relevant than ever, as in the past few years we have witnessed major crises and have been called to play pivotal roles as countries of destination, origin, and transit. Today, we have a historically responsibility. With this in mind, we have embraced the NDA to address mixed migration flows from a humanitarian perspective, raising awareness of the shared responsibility of all actors in the international system to holistically respond to the growing number of mig migrants, which according to the IOM is estimated to account for at least 3.6% of the global population. It's a lot of people. It's beyond that that the 23 objectives of this global compact contribute to the fulfillment of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, serving as a roadmap to ensure that migration is safe, orderly, and regular, while contributing to good migration governance and strengthening the humanitarian development peace nexus conductive to economic growth and development in house countries. That is certainly the case of Colombia. Our country approaches migration is also an opportunity. As has been recognized by international community, President of Colombia, Ivan Duque, took on the challenge of re regularizing more than 1.8 million migrants, 30% of the total Venezuelan migrants who fled their country because of this dictatorship that they have since the last 10 years. Through the temporary protection status, with the firm conviction of guaranteeing their human rights and fully integrating them into our society, even amid the COVID-19 pandemic. This paradigm shift from humanitarian assistance to socioeconomic integration is an example and a unique model for the world in the commitment to protect, welcome, and integrate those fleeing their countries of origin due to systemic failures and multidimensional crises. Thus, Colombia is convinced that regularization helps to prevent humanitarian tragedies, trafficking in persons as well as other serious human rights violations, and more importantly, contributes to make migrants visible by identifying them within our societies in the entire world. That is why we have placed children and more vulnerable populations at the forefront. For instance, putting forward the Childhood First policy aimed at recognizing Colombian nationality to Venezuelan minors born in Colombia, territory from Venezuelan parents who were at risk of statelessness. With this initiative, we have been able to guarantee an effective nationality and therefore the full enjoyment of the fundamental rights of at least 70,000 children by the end of the year 2021. The, 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 the temporary protection status is also a social inclusion measure through which the Colombian government grants migrants access to services such as health, education, and social protection measures, of course. At the same time, it fosters a propitious environment for migrants to be able to contribute to Colombia's development, allowing them possibility of accessing formal and dignified jobs and generating through entrepreneurship and self-employment positive and direct impacts on the productive ecosystem of our country. We are convinced that if we achieve a proper socioeconomic integration of the migrant population, Colombia will be a better country. Ladies and gentlemen, besides the update of Colombia's voluntary review, we are delighted to share Colombia's pledges in the forum, including a financial donation to IAOM during 2022, progress in the implementation of the temporary protection status for Venezuelan migrants, and the strengthening of the technical co cooperation and success experience exchanges based on Colombia's migration management. Do not, do, we don't have any doubt.
that Colombia is ready to share the good practices and transfer learning skills with all countries requiring assistance because we truly believe in the primacy of any human being and the power of solidarity. This is what Colombia is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice President of Colombia, for your very inspiring presentation. I have now the honor to welcome Ms. Sara Lou Arriola, Under Secretary General for Migrant World Affairs, Department of Foreign Affairs, Philippines, and Chair of the Asia Pacific Regional Review of Implementation of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. Ms. Arriola, please tell us about the challenges and opportunities faced by migrants in Asia and the Pacific. Thank you. Um, I see that uh, Ms. Ariola is having some technical difficulties. Uh, Ms. Ariola, are you able to turn on the video and the microphone? May I ask to our colleagues uh, in the squad to assist us? Hi, I, I'm I'm okay now. I was sorry, I was <laughs> I was having a hard time opening the video. Um, to the executive secretaries of the regional commissions, to fellow chairs of in the regional reviews, excellencies and esteemed guests, a pleasant day to everyone. Good morning from New York. I would like to thank the UN Regional Commission and its partners and stakeholders for giving me the opportunity to share the insights and outcomes of the Asia Pacific Regional Review of the GCM in pursuit of accelerating GCM implementation at the regional and national levels. The Asia Pacific region has seen large scale trends in the movement of its people whose migration is mostly intra-regional. Based on the 2020 Asia Pacific Migration Report, there were over 65 million international migrants living in the region in 2019, which is a quarter of the global international migrant stock. Meanwhile, almost 106 million migrants from ESCAP member state countries were living outside their countries of birth in 2019. This number constitutes nearly 40% of all migrants in the world and 2.2% of the Asia Pacific region's total population of 4.6 billion. Being elected as chair of the Asia Pacific Regional Review, I am honored to have taken this crucial role as it affirmed the Philippine government's decades long efforts to progress its migration policies. After more than a year of its conclusion, the regional review provided us with lessons that still ring true to the core, especially as we are now part of this historic conduct of the first ever International Migration Review Forum. The regional reviews gave us a platform to evaluate our action, actions towards achieving the GCM objectives on a regional level. It has also recognized the pressing implications of the COVID-19 pandemic on migration. The dialogues were constructive, engaging and pivotal towards our ultimate goal of improving migration governance in the Asia Pacific region. Allow me to share with you some of our main lessons from the regional review. First is the wide recognition of the positive contribution of migrants and their families to sustainable development, whether they are in countries of origin, transit or destination. Specifically, remittances were seen by countries of origin as a major source of income, which contributed to poverty reduction and improvement in the livelihood of citizens. For countries of destination, the need for human resources was filled in by its migrant population, creating this indelible link between migration and development. Second, 
representatives from all sectors were unanimous in so far as the COVID-19 pandemic had exacerbated the vulnerabilities of migrants and exposed them to an increased risk of infection, lack of access to public health services, and an availability of opportunities for decent work. In addition, migrants face xenophobia, stigma, discrimination, and inadequate protection and support services. On a positive note, the COVID-19 pandemic has prompted member states to step up their response to support and protect migrants. Good practices identified were the support for voluntary repatriation of distressed citizens, extension of stay and work permits, and increased consular assistance. It was also reported that governments in the Asia-Pacific region now have better emergency preparedness plans and relief measures, including efforts to integrate migrants in priority vaccine rollouts. Third, we learned that many member states have developed national implementation plans of the, on the GCM, including the mainstreaming of its objectives and the embedding of the same in their respective national laws, regulations, and policies on migration. For example, the Philippines has enacted a law that has an explicit provision on the progressive re realization of the 23 objectives of the GCM. What is a moral imperative has now become a state obligation. And the positive developments reported by member states include improved transparency and simplification of migration procedures, improve access to regular migration pathways, reduce costs of migration and remittance transfers, and increase bilateral and multilateral agreements related to migration. Fourth, Member states, international organizations, and stakeholders alike identify the lack of comprehensive and disaggregated data on migration and migration-related indicators as one of the significant challenges in the implementation of the GCM in the Asia-Pacific. Hence, member states suggested the possible provision of technical assistance by UN Network on Migration to improve collection and dissemination of relevant migrant data for evidence-based policymaking. Finally, the review underscored the importance of regional collaboration in advancing GCM implementation on the ground and of the leadership of the Asia-Pacific region in applying a whole of society and whole of government approach. It acknowledged the importance of global cooperation and partnerships on international migration, realizing that indeed, migration governance is shared responsibility by all countries, Member states committed to expand bilateral and multilateral cooperation and partnerships as guided by the GCM's cross-cutting and interdependent guiding principles and objectives. GCM champion countries play an important task in demonstrating consistent support and commitment to the GCM. The initiative is voluntary and open to all member states who wish to join. Ultimately, being a GCM champion country such as the Philippines signifies a sign of confidence and solidarity of member states with the GCM and the UN Migration Network. Given the above lessons from the regional review, the GCM champion countries in Asia-Pacific region took charge in organizing regional consultations to keep the momentum going and to continue the ongoing cooperation to advance the implementation of the GCM. The dialogues cut across various themes on migration and analyze its impacts on migrants and migration processes with the overall theme of accelerating safe, orderly, and regular migration in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Three consultations have since been conducted after the regional review in coordination with UNSCAP and IOM Regional Office in its capacity as coordinator of the UN Migration Network. We spearheaded the first consultation together with the government of Thailand, shedding light on the access to health services of migrants and related experiences with COVID-19 response. The second consultation was organized by the Indonesian government and tackled COVID-19 and its ramifications on the migrants' return and sustainable reintegration policy. And the third one is organized by the Cambodian government to discuss border management and labor migration in the COVID-19 recovery phase. The recently concluded ministerial meeting of GCM champions last March has also produced a joint statement called the Rabat Declaration to which a GCM champion countries reiterated the need for continued leadership and engagement of all states in implementing the GCM. This acknowledged the success of regional reviews and the fruitful recommendations that it brings to the table. However, implementation in general needs the active involvement of all stakeholders to make our goals become a reality. 
Achieving a GCM objectives cannot be done by GCM champion countries alone, so we must set an example to encourage meaningful participation of migration actors. First, we must take stock of all points raised during the regional review, especially the issue requiring immediate attention and the suggestions on how to move forward. Second, we must act on commitments we made on the GCM and the regional review, for without action, our aspirations for better migration governance will remain just that. Third, we must continue our partnership with all stakeholders, the private sector, civil society, and international organizations. Finally, we must keep track and celebrate our progress, no matter how small through knowledge sharing, exchange of best practices, and peer learning among member states. In closing, as we, today, as we seize today's opportunity for exchange that the IMRF gives, let us be reminded time and again that migration is an intersectional phenomenon. Hence, migration being a shared responsibility should prompt us to encourage everyone to participate in this tra trajectory towards a better and more inclusive global migration governance framework. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Ariola, for sharing the experiences, lessons learned, and good practices from the Philippines and from Asia and the Pacific. Um, I believe that uh, now uh, the director of the Regional Commission's New York office, Ms. Rosa, office, Ms. Rosa Malango, has already joined the meeting. And please apologize because we were experiencing technical difficulties. Um, May I please ask that you uh, give um, video and microphone access to Rosa? Uh, uh, Yera, we do not see yes. Rosa have uh, entered. Okay, so uh, I will go ahead then with the, the program. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, it is my pleasure now to invite Ms. Armida Salcia Alicia Afbana, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Secretary Secretary of ESCAP, to provide an overview of the Asia Pacific Regional Review of the GCM and highlight the follow up actions. Unfortunately, Ms. Armida Salcia Alicia Afbana cannot be with us in person, but she has kindly recorded a video message. May I kindly ask the colleagues uh, to start the video, please? Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, representatives of civil society, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to participate in this important International Migration Review Forum, or IMRF, site event to present the outcomes of the regional reviews held to track progress on implementation of the Global Compact for Migration, or GCM. The regional review processes are vital for informing the IMRF and provide the evidence base for supporting member states in advancing the implementation of, G of the GCM at the national and regional levels. International migration has been a key accelerator of sustainable development in Asia Pacific and beyond. There are approximately 109 million people from our region living outside their countries of birth. They make up about 40% of the world's migrants and contribute to economic and social development both within and beyond our borders. There are also about 67 million international migrants living in Asia and Pacific, 70% of whom come from within the region. They embody the region's dynamism, adaptability, and future. Each person seeking to better themselves and contribute to the communities from which they come and the communities to which they migrate. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in March 2021, countries in Asia and Pacific conducted a review of the GCM implementation. In a follow-up to the meeting, ESCAP has an outcome document which focuses on evidence-based good practices from the region that can inform future capacity building and the priorities identified by member states. Let me summarize two main findings emanating from this analysis. First, member states reiterated their commitment to implementing the GCM and the 2030 Agenda. They noted that achieving the Sustainable Development Goals would advance GCM implementation and vice versa. The COVID-19 pandemic, however, has hindered the regional implementation of the 2030 Agenda. 
To respond to these challenges at national and regional levels, participants called for greater integration of analytical resources into national policy making through enhanced data collection, analysis, and dissemination. They also highlighted the importance of engaging with academia and the scientific community to develop integrated methods and models that identify the links between migration, development, and environmental change. Second, participants noted that the region had made progress in cooperation, partnership, and a whole of government and whole of society approach in implementing the GCM. This was in line with SDG 17 and GCM Objective 23. Since most migration in Asian Pacific was regional in nature and growing in scale and impact, it was important to foster and strengthen more bilateral, sub-regional, regional, and cross-regional initiatives. Countries in Asian Pacific should build on the national leadership in the region, including the champion countries initiatives and through consultation with stakeholders. These partnerships could serve as a resource for implementing analytical initiatives and innovations. National leadership initiatives should be elevated through bilateral, sub-regional and regional cooperation and partnership. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, let me call on the participants from Asia and Pacific, in particular, the GCM champion countries and the many stakeholders to continue to lead by example and coll collaborate with one another in realizing our GCM commitments. Let us build on the analytical resources available and explore new ones to advance GCM implementation. By doing so, we will increase our chances of making migration safe, orderly and regular, and of not leaving migrants and their families behind. ESCAP is proud of being a member of the regional UN network on migration and stands ready to support its member states in building and strengthening national capacities, in particular on data and analysis. Let us work together to achieve the SDGs and ensure that no migrant is left behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the Executive Secretary for her remarks. Um, I believe now we should have uh, the Director of uh, the RCNYO on board. Um, may I kindly ask uh, yes. the organizers? I now have access, Sierra. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and apologies for the delay. Um, I want to thank uh, my deputy, Yera, for having begun this very important conversation. I also want to acknowledge the very important intervention just made by the Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary for ESCAP. It is my pleasure to now invite our next speaker, Dr. Munir Tabet, who is the Deputy Executive Secretary for ESCAP. Dr. Tabet, please provide highlights of the regional overview for Western Asia. You have the floor. Good morning, good afternoon. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, colleagues, guests, and panelists. It is my pleasure to join you in this discussion on what is arguably one of our most sticky and risky and rising challenges. Our world continues to witness unprecedented human mobility despite the brief disruption in travel caused by the global COVID-19 pandemic. Migrants continue to cross borders. They continue to take perilous sea crossing and flee conflicts in search of better lives. I'm stating the obvious when I say migration disrupts the lives of millions of people and their families. But well managed, it can also positively contribute to growth and development. As such, Governing migration continues to be an important policy priority for governments. Unfortunately, competing for the attention of policymakers with other priorities, cessation of hostilities and peace, food security, rising prices, debt, climate, and others. In the region where I'm currently working, the Arab countries are the origin of around 33 million migrants and refugees with 44% remaining within the region. A more revealing figure is that the Arab region with 5.6% of the world's population 
hosts 11% of global migrants and refugees. The first GCM regional review that ESWA co-led with IAM in February 2021 highlighted some of the pre-existing structural barriers that exacerbate the vulnerabilities of migrants and refugees. It also revealed some of the main challenges to the implementation of the GCM in the Arab region, including weak capacity to collect, centralize, and share migration data, political and economic instability, occupation, and conflict, which continue to be adverse drivers of migration, forcing many to leave their countries, limited financial and human resources that are available to translate migration governance frameworks into programs and initiatives that empower and protect migrants, and the need to increase intra-regional coordination and collaboration. The review also highlighted important elements that could accelerate GCM implementation, including developing migration policies and aligning GCM implementation efforts with wider development policy frameworks, creating new institutional setups and multi-stakeholder synergies to reflect a whole of government and a whole of society approach and developing the research infrastructure on migration. Excellencies, distinguished guests, the first GCM review was an opportunity to identify some promising practices and key challenges. Yet the road ahead is still long and dare I say difficult. We need to intensify our collaboration to make sure that we combat trafficking in persons, we guarantee the rights of migrants, uh, migrant children and women, we ensure that migrants have access to services without discrimination, that we reform our employment system, that we strengthen bilateral and regional cooperation on migration governance, that we reduce irregular migration and make sure that migration is always a choice, not a last desperate alternative. As ESQA, we commit to continue to building knowledge and partnership, provide spaces for dialogue and coordination, and support our countries to ensure that no migrant is left behind. Allow me to close with a call for all of us to use the lessons learned from the global pandemic and the first GCM review to galvanize and intensify our efforts to support migrants. A call to build forward better, to capitalize on the positive consequences of migration to help achieve the sustainable development goals. Together, we can better address what is fundamentally transboundary issue that requires our multilateral cooperation. Thank you very much. I thank you, Dr. Tabet, for that very inspirational intervention. And I now have the honor of uh, inviting Ms. Edlam Abera Yameru, Director, Gender, Poverty and Social Policy Division at the Economic Commission for Africa, to share with us an overview of her, the experiences of implementing GCM in Africa. You have the floor. Thank you very much. And I hope that you can hear me clearly. Just confirming, thank you, great. So uh, excellencies, distinguished representatives and uh, delegates, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am very delighted to join you here today from ECA. Um, and I would want to express to you uh, the regrets from our Deputy Executive Secretary, Hanan Morsi, who could not be with you today because uh, we uh, were committed otherwise and had overlapping uh, commitments, so apologies, and I do represent her in this uh, segment. So the African Regional Meeting to review uh, the GCM uh, took place in August of 2021, hosted by the government of Morocco. And uh, in the interest of time, I would want to highlight some very few key overview messages, which I do think connect very well with the messaging that we have heard from uh, other regional commissions uh, as well. So one of the first uh, and, and key messages I want to emphasize again, that has been highlighted by other regional commissions is that the migration agenda is a development agenda for Africa, certainly, and now more than ever in the current context of the crises that we are facing. And the meeting emphasized that um, migration uh, in Africa is indeed increasing, that we've seen an increase uh, up to 2020, 2020 and 2021. But a key message on the migration question in Africa is that 86% of Africans are migrating within the continent. 
And this is a message that has been resounding from the continent, which is really an important message um, to, at times, I would say, uh, dispel some of the myths and perceptions around migration uh, from uh, the African continent. So most of our migrants are migrating within the continent. And it's also important to emphasize this because this makes it much more of a development um, uh, potential and opportunity for us, intra-regional migration as a development uh, a driver was emphasized very strongly at the meeting. And of course, uh, as others have said, the question of remittances, uh, particularly in the African context where financing, we have huge financing gaps. The meeting did underscore that the contribution of, of the diaspora of remittances to the African continent, which amounts to about you know close to $80 billion and is about three times higher and foreign aid to the continent was, was strongly emphasized. So I think just re-emphasizing that this is a development agenda for us, it's a development priority for us, and that's how the continent sees it. A second a message perhaps linked to the first one is that migration in the current context of uh, crises, overlapping crises that we're facing is uh, one of the solutions for recovery and resilience. As we know, we've been hit by the COVID crisis, the Ukraine crisis, and the shocks that come with us with that have hit us very strongly in the African continent, particularly with respect to debt crises, you know, fiscal instability. And in this respect, as Africa grapples with these shocks, it's critical to consider migration as a development um, instrument that can aid recovery and building longer term uh, resilience. But very specifically, the meeting emphasized that labor mobility within the continent is a fundamental priority for us. It's, it's something that we must make more systematic and see as an economic lever that we must uh, harness. And in this respect, a third message that came out of the meeting is that it is a time of challenge, but it's also a time of opportunity in Africa. And one major opportunity that was highlighted is the African continental free trade area that many of you may be aware of. Africa um, has entered this uh, regional trade instrument and framework and we would want to boost intra-regional trade uh, and manufacturing within the continent by way of, of um, increasing employment and economic growth. And so the African continental free trade area will transform the continent, our continent, uh, in economic terms uh, substantially. We expect a growth in the manufacturing sector. We expect an increase in trade. We, we expect an increase in, in jobs and employment. And in this respect, we must look at migration as a core opportunity for implementing our regional um, trade uh, framework. Of course, there are, there are obstacles. The meeting emphasized that we must do better in terms of um, implementing the, or rather accelerating the implementation of global and particularly regional protocols that can facilitate migration. For example, in the African continent, the protocol on free movement of persons under the African Union is one such instrument that the meeting called for accelerated implementation. Of course, noting that labor migration should be seen as an asset, the delegates also emphasized that the private sector should be more involved in terms of uh, facilitating labor migration, facilitating portability of skills between countries linked to the industrialization and regional trade uh, agenda of the continent. A fourth key message, and uh, this is, I think, emphasized again by others, is, of course, strengthening national and regional information systems and databases as a basis for planning and uh, improved uh, policy implementation, specifically data collection uh, systems and uh, improving the integration of migration into national censuses and surveys was um, emphasized. So I, I think those are the main messages I want to emphasize, that I would want to highlight again quite striking to see these similarities across our regions and sort of the, the key messages that are resonating. And I would want to end by emphasizing that as ECA, uh, in partnership with the African Union, the IOM as well, we are uh, going to be uh, implementing interventions for our member states. And as ECA specifically, we will be focusing on the issue of labor migration, labor mobility, portability of skills, as part of our work on the African continental free trade area and the drive for greater regional integration in Africa. And secondly, also, we will be working um, quite a lot with our member states on migration data and statistics as a basis and foundation for um, uh, strengthening migration um, responses and actions uh, in Africa. Of course, we look forward to you know, maintaining and sustaining these conversations among regional commissions and our collaboration at the regional scale and really continuing to 
elevate the regional dimension and regional voice uh, in the global conversations uh, on migration. So I will, I will end up, I will end here. Thank you. I thank you very much for that overview of the experience in Africa. Um, it is now my honor to invite the next speaker, Mr. Simon Secchini, Director of the Population Division at ECLA, to please provide an overview of the experiences of implementing the GCM in Latin America and the Caribbean. You have the floor. Thank you, Rosa, Excellencies, colleagues. Uh, with more than 40 million migrants, Latin America and the Caribbean face numerous challenges with respect to migration processes at the regional, sub-regional, and national levels. The United States uh, remains the main migratory destination for regional mobility, although several countries in South America have attracted many migrants. So as noted in the case of Africa, intra-regional migration is increasingly important. All the countries of the region are affected by migration, uh, flows as countries of origin, destination, transit, or uh, return. Uh, migratory cycles in the region are explained by push factors, such as the structural lack of work opportunities, environmental disasters, and the effects of uh, climate change, as well as violence of all kinds. And by pull factors, based on greater opportunities for employment, better salaries, and family reunification. At the ECLAC, we believe that it is urgent to close the gaps around the structural gaps of migration, stemming from the lack of development, which is expressed in uh, a few wor uh, work opportunities, low wages, economic and political instability, inequality, and uh, violence. Uh, with lockdowns and border closings, uh, the pandemic played a role in slowing down some migratory flows, but it did not prevent others from continuing, such as those of Central Americans heading north or Venezuelans within the region. In addition, in the current context, uh, there is a resurgence of push factors. Latin America in 2020 was the, uh, facing the worst economic crisis in a century with a GDP contraction of 6.8%. And after the rebound in uh, 2021, uh, growth of only 1.8% is expected for 2022. And the inflationary dynamic has accelerated as of March, 2022, regional inflation is estimated at 7.5%. Currently, uh, migration in Latin America and the Caribbean is characterized by vulnerability and the growing lack of protection in the journeys of migrants who frequently suffer extortion by criminal organizations. It is common to observe uh, flows made up of uh, unaccompanied children and adolescents as well as caravans of migrants who travel long distances to their destination. Furthermore, discrimination, racism, and xenophobia continue to be observed, uh, and migrant women are particularly vulnerable to violence. Uh, migration is happening in the region in a forced way, as the only option for many people lacking opportunities. Thus, we must work to address the root causes of migration. And the, an example of our work in, the, in this sense is the comprehensive development plan for El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and South South East, uh, Mexico, the CDP. And the CDP addresses the structural causes of irregular migration, emphasizing peace, development, regional integration, multilateralism, international cooperation, and respect of sovereignty of states. The CDP proposes four pillars, economic development, social welfare, response to climate change, and comprehensive management of the migratory uh, cycle. In April 2021, the UN Executive Committee recognized that the CDP is an innovative UN system-wide strategy and cooperation platform for addressing the structural causes of migration and forced displacement uh, with a medium and uh, short-term vision. Since then, based on the priorities of each country, ECLAC has developed in coordination with four uh, resident coordinators and the Development Coordination Office, the implementation and financing strategy of the CDP, as well as georeferencing tool uh, to monitor activities to be implemented in the subregion. It is also important to know that data and information on migration in order uh, to foster appropriate government policies that are respectful of uh, human rights is key. 
the agreements of sub-regional and regional conferences, such as the Regional Conference of Migration, which covers Central and uh, North America, the South American Conference on Migration, and the Regional Conference on Population Development are key to orient appropriate migration uh, policies. At the ECLAC, we promote multilateral cooperation on migration issues. Uh, we promote a view uh, of the migratory processes in which people can make informed decisions, in which migration is not the only option for survival. At the same time, we promote an objective recognition of the contributions of, of migrants to uh, sustainable development. And we have seen uh, this in recent studies we conducted in Chile, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Peru. As coordinators of the regional network on migration together with IOM and base of the national voluntary uh, reports of 16 countries, we have presented to the IMRF the uh, regional review uh, report. And in this contribution from our region, there is a clear commitment to sustainable development, social inclusion, and respect of human rights. Also in January, 2023, ECLAC looks forward uh, to uh, hosting in Santiago, Chile, the International Forum on Migration Statistics, uh, co-organized by DESA, OECD, and IOM, data and evidence-based Analysis are crucial elements for recognizing the contributions of migrants encountering misinformation and xenophobia. In conclusion, ECLAC reaffirms its unrestricted support for all the objectives and principles of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, and will continue to provide technical support to the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean in its implementation, especially in light of the IMRF agreement. Thank you very much. I thank you very much for that very pragmatic overview of the challenges, opportunities, and lessons from Latin America and the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, I now have the pleasure to invite Professor Joseph Teye. Director of the Center for Migration Studies at the University of Ghana to provide the brief remarks. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rosa. UN agencies, distinguished guests, the media, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed, I am happy to be invited to speak at this very important event. I have been involved in the implementation of the GCM activities in Ghana, which is a champion country. I've also been involved in research on various dimensions of the GCM in West African countries. With these few minutes, I am going to share my experiences on the implementation of the GCM in West Africa. I'll be citing the examples from Ghana where appropriate. I want to to start by giving a brief overview of the migration patterns in West Africa. So what is important to note over here is why media narratives tend to suggest an exodus of West Africans to the global north. Intra-regional mobility is the dominant type of movement in West Africa. And recent figures indicate that about 72% of migrants from West Africa still move to a destination within the region. Outside Africa, Europe is the most popular destination of both regular and irregular migrants from West Africa. It is important to mention that in recent years, there have been increasing number of people moving towards the Gulf states. And this is due to the fact that there are new opportunities there. Irregular migration and violating of migrant rights at destinations are among some of the key problems in West Africa, which the GCM if well implemented, can help solve. I want to share observations on recent migration perceptions in the region. So migration has been a livelihood strategy for millennia and is still perceived as a very important livelihood strategy. In the narratives, people tend to attribute migration to poverty, but most of our recent researches have shown that poverty is not the only driver of migration. And that migration can also be driven by social transformation. So as West African countries develop, we expect more and more people to migrate. Other factors that drive migration from West Africa include conflicts and also climate change. 
We have noted that during the COVID-19 era, migration flows have reduced. This is because many of the borders have been closed and intra-regional mobility that tends to be a main livelihood strategy was affected during the COVID era. We have also noted in the COVID era that many countries do not have systems in place to provide support during times of emergencies. And that is one lesson we have learned from the COVID. The implementation of the GCM has been going on quite well after delays in its start. I must say that one area where improvement has been seen is in the area of migration governance. With the support from IOM, ILO, ICMPD, and some of the UN agencies, a number of countries in the region have developed migration governance policies and frameworks so as to ensure that the risks of migration are minimized and that the benefits are maximized. In Ghana, for instance, a national labor migration policy has been designed and has been approved by the government. A diaspora engagement policy is also being designed. Some of the countries like Scenario and Nigeria already have national labor migration policies. The ECOWAS free movement protocol, which has been implemented since 1979, has also seen some revisions and some efforts have been made to address some of the limitations and barriers to free movement in the area. One of these is harassment at the borders, where a lot of strategies have been designed by the ECOWAS countries to ensure that harassment at the borders have been reduced. Many countries are also developing strategies to ensure that migration is incorporated into national development planning system. So in Ghana, for instance, migration has been mainstream into the national development planning process. A number of the countries in the region, including Nigeria and Sierra Leone, have also made efforts to mainstream migration into development planning. All of these are in line with the GCM. Efforts have also been made to improve data collection in Afri West Africa. As we do know, the African uh, the AU Commission has established migration observatories, and one of these is in West Africa, which is in Mali. In addition to this, a number of universities, including the University of Ghana, have centers that continue to collect data on migration flows and also the impact of migration on development. There have also been strategies to deal with the root causes of unplanned migration at the ECOWAS level. So the ECOWAS member states, for instance, have developed a number of mechanisms to address climate change and then also to address conflicts. Some of these things are drivers of migration and it is believed if they are addressed, then the reduction in unplanned migration will occur. Efforts have also been made to develop mechanisms to combat human trafficking and migrant smuggling, which is pervasive in the region. Programs have also been implemented to harness the benefits of migration. In fact, a number of countries, including Ghana, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Liberia have developed mechanisms to make sure that remittances have been leveraged for development. There have also been increasing number of policies to provide a framework for engaging the diaspora for development. In fact, a number of West African countries have instituted homecoming events, for instance, to ensure that the diaspora is incorporated as part of the development uh, actors. Despite all these efforts that have been made, a number of challenges have been identified in the implementation of the GCN in the West African region. First, there is a lack of migration pathway. West Africans believe that migration is an integral part of livelihoods. And therefore, if you want to ensure safe and orderly migration in line with the GCF, the best thing to do is we be for developed countries to open borders. So the fact that we have very limited regular channels of migration is a challenge. And this is something that has to be done to ensure that people are able to migrate as and when they will. Then poverty will also have to be addressed in order to reduce unplanned migration. A number of activities have been implemented as a way of reducing poverty, but this is still not enough 
a lot more would need to be done. There is also weak capacity to collect data and analyze data. Even though I have already highlighted the fact that there have been some improvement in data collection, a lot more still needs to be done. There's also weak capacity of institutions working on migration-related policies. Many of the institutions, organizations, uh, ministries, and agencies lack people who understand migration issues, and that affects the ability to incorporate migration into planning. Policies that have been designed are also not well implemented. I've already highlighted the fact that a number of policies have been developed by a number of countries with the help of IOM, ILO, ICMPD, and other international organizations. The truth is that many of these policies are still lying on the shelves and they have not been implemented. The case of Ghana, for instance, is cited where national migration policy was designed in 2016. It's only recently that we have started the implementation. One reason for this is lack of resources. And therefore, for West African countries to be able to implement these policies, they will need support from the international community and all NGOs that are working on migration related issues. To conclude, people in West Africa believe that if well managed, migration can help to enhance development in the region. However, for this to occur, there is a need for more regular migration pathways to be created. We therefore call on popular destination countries in Europe and Asia and North America to be able to design and develop more regular migration pathways. For instance, worker holidays programs for instance can help so that people can migrate through the regular migration pathways. That is the only way to reduce irregular migration and to protect migrants. We therefore also think that collaboration is the way to go, that there is a need for West African countries to continue to collaborate with NGOs and international organizations to work together to harness the benefits of migration for development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really want to appreciate that perspective from academia in the Global South. And I encourage participants to reach out to our panelists after the event today. It is now my distinguished honor to invite Dr. Ayam Zauri, President of the Egyptian Society for Migration Studies, to provide an overview from the perspective of civil society and hence help us to conclude today's events. Professor, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> actually, I'm going to, uh, uh, since uh, most of the uh, speakers uh, uh, we're talking about the implementation. I'm going to talk about the, the uh, challenges and the upcoming uh, issues that we need to, to tackle or to uh, uh, work on. So um, well, actually the first thing that we, we, we need to, to talk about is the, uh, recommend are the recommendations about the implementation of regional and national plans and strategies on migration in the, in the uh, uh, countries uh, under uh, consideration. Uh, here I belong to two regions, uh, to Africa and to also the, the, the uh, uh, ESQUA region. So uh, in this country, we need to talk about the implementation of regional and national plans and strategies, and also to uh, uh, you know work with the uh, gaps and policy recommendations. So with respect actually to the implementation of regional and national uh, plans and strategies, we can see that many countries have adopted the migration plans and strategies, but there are gaps between policies and their implementation, So, uh, which must be addressed. So we need to address the, the gaps between implementation and these uh, policies. A second issue regarding the, the uh, uh, regional and national plans is data and data and data. So data must be available to stakeholders in order to monitor and implement the implementation of the GCM objectives and to uh, contribute to the development of evidence-based policies. Data is not actually related to objective number one. They are related to the 23 objectives of the GCM. Uh, third, 
the regional consultations with various stakeholders on migration issues are very encouraging the, 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 uh, in the last four years. These regional consultation platforms should be strengthened and maintained by regional institutions, which are the regional commissions in the upcoming years, with the same strength as the same engagement of all stakeholders and uh, different countries. The, with respect to uh, gaps and policy recommendation, there's the need for consistency between national laws and international frameworks for the protection of migrants and ensuring the rule of law and uh, equality, uh, equality before the law for all, including migrants. The uh, second issue with respect to the gaps is the uh, gender, gender sensitive. So we need to develop gender sen sensitive migrant protection policies that we need to strengthen if they are developed we need to strengthen them in all countries including uh, wage protection including protection against violence uh, facilitating remittances and combating uh, discrimination the uh, next uh, uh, issue is the emphasizing the role of cities in migration governance, uh, which is actually we, we usually talk about states. We don't talk about lower levels like cities because cities are the main um, destination for all migrants. So we need to talk about cities in migration governance and emphasizing the need to involve local bodies in the development and implementation of migration policies. We need to have a second layer for each country, not only the overall uh, national migration policy, but also the, the, the a lower level related to cities and the the uh, maybe uh, states or governors or provinces with more uh, flow of migrants. The fourth issue and the last issue with respect to gap and policy recommendations is actually addressing the negative drivers of migration, including conflicts, wars, and bad governance in light of the new developments with uh, new developments. I'm talking mainly about the, the uh, uh, negative impact of COVID-19 and also the instability in uh, the, the world as a whole. Thank you very much. I want to thank you so much um, for changing the focus and for that very important contribution. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached the end of this side event. It has been a pleasure and an honor to serve as your moderator. And I want once again, thank for my deputy for stepping in before I did. I want to thank all the presenters for sharing the important reviews, the reflections, their insights and their recommendations. It is our understanding that the regional commissions working with their partners will soon be making plans to assess GCM implementation at both national and regional levels again. As we heard today, a lot has been done, but much still remains to be done. We cannot end our conversation today without recognizing that migrants unfortunately continue to face incredible levels of discrimination and migrant women and girls face heightened risk of gender-based violence. With borders being closed, many migrants are stranded without income or shelter, unable to return home, separated from families and with uncertain futures. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time that as world citizens, we show solidarity with migrants. Let us reaffirm both our personal and institutional commitment to safe and dignified migration. Let us remember that without Dr. Salim and Dr. Turesi, Turkish immigrants to Germany, we would not have the COVID-19 vaccine today. And as Nelson Mandela once said, as long as poverty, injustice, and gross inequality persist in our world, none of us can truly rest. It is in this spirit that I invite us all to continue to engage with the regional commissions, with all the partners, to take these lessons learned and good practices and make them a reality from every village, every city, every community, all the way around the world. I understand that the regional commissions will be summarizing the main messages and recommendations from the side event, and we'll be sharing them with you in due course. Until then, thank you for being at the front line of bringing dignity to the migrants, and thank you for making sure that your regional voice 
was shared today at the global level. Thank you and have a great day. Goodbye.